Okay, hi everybody. Welcome to week four of our Kotlin class. Does anyone have any questions before we start up? I am going to take that as a no. I'm not getting any thumbs up or anything or any type of hands up or chat things. So, so far so good, huh? Hopefully the assignment went well. Um, any questions on the assignment? Okay, I'll take that as a no. So let's go ahead and start on here. Um, what I'd like to do to start with here is let's talk about packages. And that's going to be that thing you see up there. Um, the whole idea of packages, whether you're in Java or in Kotlin, is just a namespacing. It's a scoping for your different pack, different types that you're creating, different functions that you're creating. Uh, the uh, Behind the scenes, the packages are actually going to be stored in a directory, but that's not really a language specific. That's just an implementation detail. Uh, for all we know, they could all be stored in the exact same directory and it really wouldn't matter. The reason they put them in different directories though is so that the file names don't collide with each other. Each of these packages can be a single word or can be multiple words. So what we might typically do, let me go ahead and uh, create a new package up in here. And instead of calling it week 401, I'm going to call it uh, com.javadude.sample. And when you create these package names, let's create a little file inside there. Let's call it sample. Package names recommended to start with reversed domain name. Now the reason behind this is you're trying to make sure that whenever you write any code, your code is going to be unique from anybody else's code. Whether you're writing a library that a bunch of people are going to be using, or whether you're writing some local helpers that you're only you and maybe your, your people you work with are going to use, you still want to make sure these are going to be unique. You really wouldn't want to have a package called UE. And if you had a UE package, there's probably going to be a good chance that somebody else is going to have a UE package as well. So early on with Java, they came up with this naming convention and the naming convention starts with the top level domain. So that's the com or net or, you know, org, whatever uh, your domain name is. And then the rest of your domain name. So in this case, I own javadude.com. If I use that, I should really be the only person using that domain. It makes it unique for me. Now, if you don't have a domain, what some people will do is they'll get an account at GitHub or something like that and they'll use their uh, their GitHub. So it would be something like com.github.javamage, which is mine, for example. And that, again, is a unique name that only you are going to be using. And that's really the goal here, is to make sure you have a unique name for these things. The packages can have sub-packages. And one thing that I want to say about sub-packages, let's actually create one here. Let's say that we created a package called data underneath there. Note how it's being displayed here. If we took a look on the file system, what we'd end up seeing, actually, let me just use a little widget up here. If we go to the, the gear, we can come down here and, oh, they've changed this. So, okay, so under tree, tree appearance, we can get rid of this compact middle packages. And what we're gonna see is the directory structure that's actually underneath this. So if we looked at this week four, we have week four, source, main, Kotlin, com, Java dude, sample. And underneath sample, there's two things. We have this subdirectory called data. So we're kind of using that as a sub package. But then we also have files that are going to belong to that com Java dude sample package itself. The package name should match this directory structure. So underneath the Kotlin directory, you'll see how we have com Java dude sample. Com Java dude sample is the package that we're choosing here. Depending on what you do, I think we'll get an error if I do that. Yep, or a warning. If I change the name and float over it, it's going to say the package directive does not match the file location. And that just makes it easier for people to find things when they're taking a look at your packages. If they're looking just flat on the file system, they can see where this package exists much more simply. So I'm going to make sure I keep that in sync. Now, likewise, under data, if I created a new file under here that I'm going to call data, note that his package is com Java dude sample data. One thing that's really important to note between these two packages is this package name has nothing 
to do with com.javadude.sample. And that's really important because sometimes people think if you're importing things from a package, it also imports from a sub package. And that's not true. That actually doesn't happen. These are just a name. Com Java Dude sample data is just a name. The dots really don't mean anything from the language point of view. They only mean something from how we happen to be laying it out in the file system. So, you know, the language Kotlin or the language Java really doesn't care about those dots. It's just like any other character to them. So this guy is in a subdirectory of this guy, but that's all that matters. Any questions on that so far? Let's see how we use these things. If we're in our sample here, well, let's first of all write some data. Let's create a data class in here. I'm going to call it person. And I'm going to give him a var name, which is a string, and a var age, which is an int. So similar to what we've seen for other person classes that we've been creating. And let's say that I want to use this person in a different package. Now, if we're using it in the same package, let's actually uh, put something in here. I'll create a new class here. Let's call it DAO. I'm just going to pretend that I'm creating a, a data access object for this. And so I might have a class person DAO. And maybe this is supposed to be storing and getting people from a database. So I might have a fun insert passing in a person. And it's going to do something to put it in some database. Now let's just put a, I'll just use a to-do comment. Put in database. And then maybe a delete to delete from the database. And maybe an update. Update in database. And then maybe we want to have some way of fetching. So let's say we're going to get a person by, well, we'll get him by his name since that's what we have here. You know, actually, I'm going to do this a little bit more correctly. Let's go ahead and define a, an ID inside of our person. I'm going to say var ID string. But let's give him a default value so that we don't actually have to pass in an ID and have a chance of him being uh, conflicting. And what I'm doing here is using a universally unique ID. This is an ID that's going to be unique based on the machine that you're on. I believe it uses a MAC address as part of its, it, when it's hashing it together to create a unique identifier. And then some randomness. And uh, this ID will, and the time is built into it as well. So this ID will be unique from any other ID you create. It's a great way to create IDs for stuff that you're going to stick in a database, for example. So go back to here. Maybe I'm going to look this thing up by an ID. So find person by ID in from the database. And that's going to return a person. So maybe we have all this uh, these functions here using a person. Now note that I didn't have to do anything special to use this person. This person is in the exact same package name. So any classes, any files that are in the same package are going to have access to each other. So this guy here and this guy here, let's go ahead and just pull them over there. These two files can see each other, oh, not the sample one, the DAO here. So the DAO can see this person because they happen to be in the same namespace. So you don't have to qualify that. Sample, on the other hand, won't be able to see the person directly. So if I came in here and I said val person equals person, and I'm trying to create a person here with my name and age, note that it's going to be an error because I haven't specified what person means. In these particular cases, when I say person here, the compiler is going to take a look at that and say, okay, you didn't define person in this file. Let's see if I can figure out someplace else it might be. And the next step it does is look to see if there's a person defined in the same package. And if so, it will use that. Now, there are some top-level classes that are going to automatically be uh, seen from everywhere. You know, there's, a, you know, there's a Kotlin package that everything gets pulled in from. In Java, there's a Java Lang package that things get pulled in automatically. But for the most part, when you're looking at, at uh, symbols inside your file, like person, it's going to first of all look inside the file, 
possibly inside of a class like a nested inner class first. And then if it doesn't find it defined anywhere, it's going to check to see does it exist in the same package. Now that obviously doesn't work here because the package name is different. And notice even though it looks like it's a nested package, it's not going to find it. It's a completely different package name. So what we need to do is we need to tell the compiler which person we're talking about here. And we can do that using an import statement. So we'll say import and we'll grab the package name, put a dot, and then per put the actual person name there. And boom, now we're going to, oops, let's say name equals and age equals. That'll fix that up because it assumes that if you just are using positional parameters, the ID is always going to be first. So maybe we want to move the ID to the end, and then you can use name and age positionally as well as named. Uh, but in this case, I'm just going to use them as named parameters. So we'll notice that it's able to find the person because the compiler, first of all, says, is it in the same file? No. Is it in the same package? No. Did you explicitly state where it is? Well, it's going to look at that first. So since we explicitly stated where person is, boom, you can use it just like that. Now we can also give this an alias if we want to. Maybe something like that by saying as some person. And this is giving a nickname. And that's really useful if you happen to have two different classes in different packages that have the same name and you want to use both of them. You can rename it inside the, the file when you're importing it if you'd like to. And so in this case, then we could say some person and boom, it actually pulls that in. Okay. Not something you're going to have to do very much, but every once in a while, that's actually a very nice feature to have. So I'm going to say can alias the imported type in case of a conflict. Now, another way you can handle a conflict like that, let's go ahead and actually create a real conflict here. Let's create a new package. I'll call it data2. Let's put a person in there as well. New, we'll just create a class here. We'll just call it person. And let's say data class person. And let's just have this one have just a name. That's all he's going to have inside of him. So we'll know that it's actually a different person that we're trying to deal with. So when I go back over to my sample here, if I try to say person, again, it doesn't know which person we're talking about. So I could explicitly import it. But then let's say I wanted to use that other person as well. So one thing I could do is fully qualify that name. So if I take a look at that other person that I created here in data two, I can come back over and fully qualify this guy and say Scott in there, and now he's perfectly happy. And this is one way that you can have the same name be used from different packages. You can fully qualify them. And in Java, this is the only way you could do that if you ever wanted to have uh, two symbols from different packages come in. You'd have to overload them, like override them like this, explicitly stating that fully qualified package name. This is where it's useful to have that uh, uh, aliasing. So if I did here as complex person, and maybe I do this other one, data two, as simple person, now I can just use simple person and complex person and oops i did them backwards kind of like that so this is where the aliases come in handy if you have a conflict like that hopefully that doesn't happen too often uh, but with uh, fairly common names this may end up happening so just something to, to know about there okay so we've got those imported there uh, now let's talk about if we wanted to give kind of a fallback. So right now, if I tried to use person, so I come in here and say person three equals person, and I'll say name equals, let's say Mike, and age equals 34, something like that. Note that once again, person is not being found because I don't explicitly say 
to use something and expose it as person to the compiler. I have to do something about this particular person here. Now what I could do is add in an import and notice that the imports have to appear before any other code. So they're after the package, but before any other code. So I could do something like this. And what is he not happy about there? Com Java dude sample person. That's interesting. Is that because these guys exist? Well, I'll be darned. I guess it's because we've explicitly imported these here. I'm going to go ahead and comment these guys out for the moment. So can alias to resolve conflicts. I already had that there. And we'll comment these out. Alias examples. So what this is doing is this star says, if you see a symbol somewhere that you don't recognize, see if it exists underneath com Java dude sample data. So it's not actually pulling anything in. It's just giving it a name for lookup. And these imports don't pull anything either. It's just a naming convention. So it's saying when you see complex person, I mean this. When you see simple person, I mean this. In this case, it's saying if you see a name you don't recognize, see if it's under com Java dude sample data. Now this is a really, really bad idea. I'm gonna put an extra really on there. And you really shouldn't be doing this. This is actually called import on demand. And just uh, so you'll know, if I go to javadude.com, I wrote an article a long time ago called import on demand is evil. And I'm going to go ahead and paste that in see that import on demand is evil and let me explain exactly why it's amiable it, why it, amiable why it's evil it's a, a pretty simple concept and this is something that early on in java caused all sorts of problems so let's say that in this package data we had i'll create a file i'll create a class here let's call it um, address well let's go ahead and use the uh, the the java example here Let's say that I had, um, well, I'll, I'll do this kind of like what Java had early on. Let's create a new package. I'll call it fake Java dot util. And let's create another package in here called UI. So I have two little helpers here, your two packages. One that's going to contain some utility classes. One that's going to contain some user interface stuff. So let's take a look here. I'm going to create a class that I'm going to call list. Actually, not in there. I wanted it in. Oh, actually, I do want it in there. So a new class I'm going to call list. And this class represents a user interface list of stuff on the screen so that you can scroll it, you can choose things from it, whatever. And this existed in the original user interface package in, in Java called AWT. And let's say that underneath the um, util one, I have a class called vector. And this is a list of data. So in Java 1, you had this vector class, which they replaced later on, uh, because vector in this case was a fairly slow class, the way it was actually implemented. Um, but this uh, this class here was just for holding on to data. And in uh, the vector, uh, somebody have a question? I thought I heard something. Okay. So in the uh, the vector is for getting data. The list is for presenting stuff on the screen. And so what would happen sometimes is uh, let's make a package here. My fake Java app. So in this application, fake Java app, 
we might have an import fake Java dot UE dot star and a fake Java dot util dot star. And then inside here, maybe we use a private val um, UE list equals list. So we'll just create our little list there. And then maybe a private val data list equals a vector, something kind of like that. And this all works great. So let's say that I wrote this code. I had my application working beautifully. I push it into my repository and maybe everything's working great. And a year later, we need to add a new new feature to it. And we really haven't touched it in quite a long time. Well, later on, a new version of Java comes along or just more generalized, new versions of these libraries come out. So maybe there's a new version of the UE library, new version of the util library. These could be part of the actual Java system itself or Kotlin in our case, or they could be third party libraries that we're pulling in from different places. And in the meantime, one of the changes they made in this util package was that they added a class called list. And this is a more efficient data list. So it's not a user interface list. So we just added this. Notice we only added code. We didn't modify any existing code. We didn't change anything. Watch what happens when we go back to our fake Java app. Our fake Java app no longer compiles. And this is because it's saying, okay, let's take a look at list. Where do I find it? Well, it's not defined explicitly. Is it in fake Java UE? Is it in fake Java util? Well, in this case, I float over this. It says there's not enough information to, uh, whoops, that is a different error than I was expecting there. Oh, <laughs> I'm going to rename that one because there's actually a list class that's in that's automatically available in Kotlin. So poor choice there. I'm just going to rename him to list two. We'll rename this one to list two as well. And let's go back to our fake app and make this be a star. There we go. So. Later on, just by adding a class called list2 to that package, it makes my existing code that used to compile beautifully no longer work. So these are evil. Anytime you have a language feature that lets you have perfectly compiling code, and then if somebody adds a piece of class or adds a class to a library, your code breaks. That's kind of ridiculous. That shouldn't happen. If somebody changes the name of something or changes an interface or something, then yeah, hey, all, all bets are off. But just adding code shouldn't break existing code. And that, that's a problem with language design here. So never, ever, ever do that. What we want to do instead is explicitly stay where you're getting these from. And what we can do with our IDE is help us out there. If I hit control space after these, it says there's two places that list two exists, fake, U, fake Java UE, fake Java util. So in this case, I really intended that UE list. I'm going to choose the fake Java UE one, and it adds in that import for me. I can come down here and do the same thing. In this case, I'm hitting alt enter, which gives me an option import. It'll do a very similar thing. It just says, which one do you mean here? And I'm going to say I mean the fake Java util. Boom. Note that it was actually seeing the Java one as a valid option because we're compiling our Java on top of the Java the Java JDK. So never ever ever use this import on demand. It's it's a really horrible horrible language feature. Uh, it's one of the things in Java that I think they did very very wrong up front. Um, there's a couple other things that I'm really down on with Java. Um, the bigger thing, you know, now that we have Kotlin, Kotlin's so much easier, I don't want to use Java. Uh, but there still were a lot of features that were, they were good features in Java. This was a really bad one. Okay, any questions on that? Okay, so these imports are just giving you a name. So when I say list, I mean fake Java UE list. When I say vector, I mean fake Java util vector. Okay. Any questions? 
So that's pretty much all I wanted to talk about packages. I, I like to make a big deal about it simply because of this import on demand. Um, I know it can be tempting, but the IDE takes care of this stuff for you. And some people are like, well, I don't want to have to do it in an IDE. It doesn't matter. I mean, you can set up, you know, any type of editor that has some kind of language specifics. We'll give you the option to collapse this away because some people are like, oh, I don't want 3 million imports that I have to scroll past every time I'm doing this inside Emacs. Um, first of all, don't use Emacs for this. Use use ID. I, I use IDEA. Um, but if you insist on using Emacs, Emacs has folding. Most languages do. And so you can just fold those away and not even have to look at them. And you, in most IDEs, you can go ahead and auto fold those as well. I think you can even do that in VI or VIM now. Um, so, uh, you know, don't worry about that. It's not a big deal. And, you know, if you have support for helping you automate it, use that support. It really makes your life a lot simpler. Okay, so that's kind of the idea about packages that I want to talk about there. I'm going to go ahead and move on a little bit here. Let's get all these out of the way. There we go. And let's see. So that I'm going to go back to this option here and change tree appearance back to compact middle packages. And then that'll set that up. Notice that it still has these sub packages. You can actually flatten that out by coming here and saying flatten packages. And then you'll always see the fully, pack, fully qualified names. Um, if you prefer them nested, that's cool. I'm going to go ahead and leave them in this format just so you can see the full package names rather than having them be nested like that. Okay, so we've taken care of those guys, got our fake UE and all that type of stuff, fake Java app. Let's take a look at inner classes. This is a scoping thing. Sometimes you're going to write some code where it makes a lot of sense to uh, hide a name. So rather than have everything be a top level class name, maybe you want to put something nested so that nobody else has to worry about what that is. So maybe, for example, we might have a class binary tree. How's the, is this giving anybody some uh, bad flashbacks to college here? Hopefully not. Binary trees are easy. Um, but let's say inside a binary tree, we want to define a node inside that tree. So the idea of the binary tree class itself, he's not the recursive part. The node is the recursive part. A binary tree is just kind of your handle to the overall tree so you can ask it questions and things. So inside of here, I'm going to say something like, I'm going to, I, uh, I'm going to have an inner class node. And this guy is going to, let's see, what am I? Uh, I'm trying to remember which way I wanted to go about this. There we go. So an inner class node is the thing that's actually going to keep track of the data that you're going to be dealing with. And I'm just blanking on something I wanted to do with this. Uh, oh, oh, I know the difference here. <laughs> so if you just say node by class node by itself inside there, there's the difference. I, I was getting hung up on a little Java syntax and uh, going that direction instead of Kotlin because I, I don't do this that often in Kotlin. But let's say we want to hide the node class inside a binary tree. If I do it this way, anytime you reference that node class, you have to say binary tree dot node in order to create an instance of it. So for example, if I had a, a main here that I'm defining, I can create a binary tree. Kind of like that but if i wanted to create a node and i try doing it uh, just by itself it's not going to see it because that is not a top level entity that way it won't conflict with anybody else we're reducing our, our um, surface area of our api and when i talk about surface area i mean the unique names and functions and things that you can interact with in your api uh, the more names you have there, the harder it is for somebody to understand. And that's why we do things like overloading functions so that people have common names for things that may have several different ways of calling them, but it reduces the, the conceptual namespace for things. So having this node class, which we really don't need outside the binary tree, having that as a top level just pollutes our namespace. Now note that the way I wrote this, I can say 
create the binary tree node that way. And this only works if node is visible. And remember in Kotlin, default is public final. So that that uh, inner class there that we're defining, class node, is being created because I have access to it. It's public. Now, if instead I wanted to say, you know, outside of this class, people should never be able to get this. I could say private class, and then look what happens. It won't let me get to that node directly, which is probably what I wanted in this situation. So I want to be able to define this binary tree that people interact with. And inside, he has some data structures that he just wants to keep private. Nobody outside needs to know about these data structures. So I'm going to comment him out like that. Any questions so far? Let's go ahead and build this example up a little bit more. So inside here, I'm going to make this a data class just to have some, some data inside of it. And let's say this is just going to hold integers. So I'm going to say val int, which is an integer. I actually would say value, which is an integer. And we'll talk about you know making this more real for a binary tree with left and right and things like that a little later when we start talking about nullability. But for now, let's just hold the data inside there. And I'm going to have a, eh, let's do this. For the moment, I'm just going to say val, private val uh, dummy node is going to be a node with a zero value, just to hold on to that for a minute. And then I can have a private val of our, yeah, we can have our root equals dummy node. And what is he not happy about there? order. That might help. Do our initializers in order there. So this is going to set our root there. And let's say that we wanted to insert something. Well, I'm not going to do that right now. Well, we'll do a dummy insert. Insert. And I'm going to put a value that we want to put into the, the tree. And we'll just say root equals node value. So not a good implementation of a binary tree yet, but we're going to get to it eventually when, once we learn about some nullability. I'll help use this as part of that example. Um, but this might be how we would use this. And then inside here, we could say binary tree dot insert 42. And then that'll create that node for us. It actually is going to have root is going to be a pointer to a node with a value inside of it. So we can get that later on. This node will have pointers to other nodes, creating our recursive data structure. Any questions so far? Now let's suppose that we want to have that node actually access some other data in the containing class. So let's call this binary tree one. And let's come over here and make that be a binary tree one. Let's create a binary tree two. Note that in Kotlin, you can have any number of top level classes and they can be public, private, whatever. Versus in Java, you can have exactly one public class in any given file. So that's a, that's one of the big differences between them. And I like this because there's sometimes you'll have a collection of very small classes that you really want to keep together. It makes it much more readable. If your classes start to get bigger, you know, more than a page or so, then it really behooves you to split them out into separate files to keep them a little more straight. But if they're a bunch of small things, especially like a bunch of little data classes that you're creating, and maybe they're only holding data, then having them in a single file might be just perfectly fine. And uh, quite often what I'll do is I'll start with a with one file that contains a bunch of things and gradually parse them out as things grow. Just kind of depends on your style there. But I do like being able to keep some things together when they're very, very highly related. So let's say for this binary tree, maybe there's, um, let's say there's a function that we want to call to do a printing to print out that value. So if I had a fun here called print value, and we're gonna say it's a value int, and this is gonna be a really straightforward, let's print the value, hey, surprise, surprise. And let's say that I wanted to call that from inside the node. So in here, 
I come in and I have some function foo. And, you know, I'm actually, I'm going to call it in order. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But we could use it for an in order traversal. And maybe what I want to do is say print value. Value. Look at what happens here. So in this version of this, this is a member function of binary tree two. And down here, this is a separate class. I'm just going to call it a nested class. And let's put a little better comment here. It happens to live inside binary tree two. Now, because he's a separate class, he's just a nested class, he doesn't have access to any of the data inside his parents or any of the functions inside his parents does not have access to data functions, let's say properties, in container class. So this is just like we had a that had node be a top level class, but we're putting him inside binary tree just for that naming and just for making sure that nobody outside the binary tree sees him. And in many cases, this is fantastic. In many cases, you don't need to have access to things outside. But this example that we just wrote, we want to have access to that. So in this case, I'm going to say cannot call does not have access to container instance. If we do want that, let's go ahead and create a binary tree 3. What we need to do is tweak this class to call it an inner class. And we cannot, cannot combine it with data, unfortunately. Um, so you're going to lose a little bit of functionality there. It won't generate the, uh, the print, the equals, and the hash code and things like that. So you want to try to make sure this is really what you need to do. Um, this guy, whoops. Inner classes have a pointer to the containing instance. And so now if I come in here, we can call that because this node has an implicit pointer to the containing binary tree that creates it. And in fact, now that we made this an inner class, I won't be able to create this from the top level. I can only create it from within the confines of a binary three, binary tree two. So if I came down here and tried to say val node equals binary tree three dot node, and let's say that I made that public for the moment, note that I don't have access to that. If I come down here and float over it, constructor of inner class node can only be called within the receiver of the containing class. So somewhere in the object that this binary tree is currently representing has to be this construction. So here and here, those are perfectly fine to create it, but I can't create it like this because I don't currently have a binary tree node instance that can be its container. Does that make some sense? Cannot create instance of inner class from outside containing class. And I'll comment him out as well. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and make him private again, which is probably what I wanna have do, but note that he now has access to that data upside here. Now this can be a little bit of a problem if you're trying to go a little more functional on things. So if you're trying to make sure that your functions don't have side effects, this one here, because he's calling another function outside, there may be a side effect involved. This guy here might be doing something extra, like uh, setting a value or changing something inside the binary tree. You have to be kind of careful about that. Um, but this is something that you can do to call some common functionality. Another thing you could do instead 
is pass in a reference to this into the node when you're creating it. And that way you wouldn't have to have an inner class. You would just have a completely separate class, the nested class, that you're passing data into. And that's actually a much nicer way to do it. The trade-off, of course, is that now you have an extra pointer inside each of those nodes to point to that function that you're holding on to. Okay, so that's the basic idea of an inner class inside there. Any questions on that? So most of the time I will keep them as just nested classes as opposed to full on inner classes so that I have that capability to hide that, that type, but it doesn't depend on anything on the outside of it. Okay, so let's come into here and take a look at this guy. Now let's talk about nullability. This is awesome. Kotlin keeps track of the nullability of, of, uh, very, of properties as a top-level concept. It's actually baked into the language. In Java, we didn't have this baked in. You could add in some extra annotations to kind of help it, but it didn't always work because it would ha you'd have to make sure that everywhere along a call chain, you'd say if something can return a null or not. And in Java, that might look something kind of like this. Let's create a package. And inside there, maybe, let's see, we have a, let's make a class person with a string name and an int age. And I'm going to be really bad about this and just leave those as public. Well, actually, yeah, I'm going to leave those as public. No, actually, those are not public. Those are package protected if I don't put them on there. See so what happens when you're not away, not in Java programming every day? You forget about little details like this. So I'm just going to make these public. Bad idea. But this is a silly example. Anyway. I strongly, strongly, strongly recommend that if you're programming in Java, never make any of your, your variables public. It's, it's just a bad idea because then you're losing your encapsulation. You're use, losing that protection of the data. It's much better to make them private and expose them. But I don't want to write all that mess right now. So let's say inside here, I want to keep track of a person. Oops. So I say private person person. Now the first thing, when we take a look at this, we don't know if null is really a valid value for a person or not. In this case, it has to be. Null is the default. And this is another thing that's actually quite nice in Kotlin. They don't have default values for initializers you have to explicitly put in the initializer. So you can't go wrong. Um, in Java, default initial values are zero like or null. I'll say, let's say zero, false, or null. That's the easiest way to look at that. So if you have numbers, they're gonna be zeros. If you have a Boolean, it's gonna be false. Uh, if you have a uh, pointer, it's going to be null. And I can't for the life of me what, remember what the, uh, the value of a character is. I think it's going to be whatever the character representation of, of um, ASCII 0 is, or Unicode 0, which is the same thing either way. Um, Unicode characters, this, the first 128 characters are ASCII, uh, just for consistency there. Um, the, uh, you get these values by default. So in this case, we know that null has to be valid. So I'm going to say... In this case, it has to be because null is the default there. If, however, I did something like this, and I created a person like that, what are we saying here? Oh, so the, the field is never used. Don't worry about that. Um, but here, can we assign null? We're not being clear on that. It totally depends on how I manage this variable inside here. 
So if I had a function, public void set person, and I say person person, let's say set person two, and then I said inside of here, this dot person two equals person. I'm still not saying anything because somebody could pass a null in for that. However, if I put a little code in here and said if person is null, then maybe throw new illegal argument exception. Cannot use null person. Something kind of like that. Now, if we take a look at this, there's no way that I could be setting a null value. And because I explicitly set a value there, I'm not initializing it to null. It still doesn't tell the reader, though, what's going on. It doesn't give them any idea that this is an invalid thing to do. So what we can do is be a little more explicit on this. And we could say at nullable, I'll make it person three, And if we come in here and make this be a person three as well, we can do the same kind of thing here. And now we're telling people about this. But let's see what happens when we put a main in here. And we say, um, what is this overall guy? Java nulls. So Java nulls, Java nulls equals new Java nulls. Oh, that's so verbose. And if I say Java nulls set person three null, look at what happens. Oh, sorry, that's nullable. Duh. Let's make a person four that's not nullable. So we'll say not null. This will be person four. Not null. Assign that to person four and do that. Let's look at what's going on here. Notice how it's just kind of highlighting the null here. There's a lint check being run here as part of the build that is saying, hey, you know, maybe you're doing something you didn't really mean to do. It's not a compiler error. This code will still compile and will still run. That nullable is just giving a hint for the lint tool to help flag this when it can. And it can't always do that. If I had a set person indirect, set person four indirect, and maybe this function didn't have that annotation, I can then say set person four person. And notice there's nothing here saying anything about that call to to uh, person four being potentially an issue. And then down here, if I say set person four indirect, boom, no warnings whatsoever. Now what's he complaining about here? Oh, so he knows that he can receive it. So we're getting a, a flag here. So their lint is doing a little bit better, but again, it's still not a compiler error. This is a lint check. And so we can still do bad things. And quite often people are gonna ignore these warnings. Um, if you run a build with passing in the treat all warnings as errors, then it will actually be a compiler, compiler error, I think. I'd have to check that because that's, that's a compiler switch. Um, there may be a way with lint to force it to fail to build with lint if you have uh, any warnings. Um, but this doesn't stop you, and that's a bit of a problem. Kotlin, on the other hand, actually bakes in true null checks. So when you say something is null or not, it means something. So if I did something like a class nullability, and let's define a data class person here with the var name. Oh my God, this is so much nicer than writing Java code. And I come in here and I say private person, person, this, First of all, I need an initializer. If I try to say equals null there, that won't work. If I float over this, it's going to say, whoops, oh, I need a val or a var. 
let's make it a var so we can change these things. If I try to assign it to null, it's going to come back and say, no, you can't do that. And if you float, it says null cannot be a value of non-null type person. Whenever you just reference a type without putting a question mark at it after it, it's not nullable. So I have to create some kind of a dummy person to start with. Or maybe a real person to start with. If, however, I come in here and I say, let's call this person one and person two and say question mark, now that's valid, which means nullable. And this is actually a compiler error. As we saw before, when I tried to assign this guy to null, it gave me a real compiler error on that. And actually, let's just go ahead and do this. And if I come out here and make a main, and then I say val nullability equals nullability, and then I try to say nullability dot person one equals null. Boom, I can't do that because I said it's explicitly not null. If I try to do it with person two, yep, that'll work just fine because I said person two can take a null value. And this gives us so much extra nice checking. This was probably one of the biggest faults in Java is that they didn't have proper nullability checking built into the language. And doing this in Kotlin makes it so that you can't have a null pointer exception on things that you say can't be null. Now, obviously, if you have something that's nullable, you can reference it. And if you reference it when it's null, that could create problems. But because the compiler knows that he's nullable, he will help you along the way to say, no, you can't do that. So let's say that we wanted to get the name of a person. Let's say I want to print this out. I'm going to say println nullability, oh, come on, dot person one dot name. That works and it should work because I know that nullability is not null. I assigned it to a non null nullability. Remember that this is the same thing as adding in that type, it infers that type from the right-hand side of the of the equals. Nullability isn't going to be null. I'm going to go and get person one, which can't be null. I'm good so far. I can follow that and go get the name. Works great. But what if I try to do this with person two? Uh-oh, got an error. If I float over that dot, he's going to say only safe or non-null assertion calls are allowed on a nullable receiver of type person. And what this is saying is nullability is non-null. I go and get person two, which might be null. So it might not be valid to go any farther down this, this dot chain. So there's a couple things we can do about this. The thing you're going to want to do 99.9999999% of the time, and keep those nines going for quite a while, is put a question mark in front of that. Oops, what did I do? Oh, I had it highlighted. Okay, so what this says is this says nullability is non-null, so I get that. Go and get person two, which might be null. This null safe accessor is what that's called. Says if at this point, the stuff on my left side is null, we're done. Don't try to go any further. Just return a null. If, however, it's not null, keep going. And only keep going if it's not null. So nullability, get person. If it's null, boom, result is null. Otherwise, return the name. Let's put that in here. If left side is null, stop and return null. Otherwise, keep going. And this is amazing. Let's think about what we would have had to do in a language like Java that doesn't have this operator. I might have had to say it, uh, if nullability dot person two is not equal to null, then println nullability 
dot person two dot name. Uh oh. Something's not too happy there. We'll come back to that. And let's say that we had, let's go a little deeper on this. Let's have it add in a var father. Oops, no, I actually want that in person. Father is going to be a nullable person, which we default to null. So I could have had a if nullability dot person two dot father is not equal to null. Then print out something like that. Let's do this with a print lin nullability dot person two question mark dot father question mark dot name. And we'll say similar to this stuff. And if you've used a language like Java, I'm sure you've written lots of code like this where you check for, okay, is this thing null? Now is a nested thing null? Now is a nested thing null? And then go on and do something. And that's just really super gross. But let's see what was going on with those errors that ended up happening. I'm gonna go ahead and pull that over here. So let's float over this. We're checking to see if nullability person two is not equal to null. When I float over this, Smart cast to nothing is impossible. But it's, oh shoot, this is going to be a. That's unfortunate the way that's coming up there. Um, trying to think of how I want to walk through this because this this isn't giving quite the error message that I wanted to here. Um, let's do this. Let's just stop here. And let's see if that gives the error that I wanted. Okay, well, it's kind of saying the thing that I wanted to. The message has changed a little bit here. Um, but let's take a look at this for a second. Let's, I'll go ahead and go back to that previous if that we had there. There we go. Let's think about what's going on here. If we float over this guy, he says, smart cast to nothing is impossible. Don't worry about that part of it. Worry about the second part because nullability person two is a mutable property that could have changed by this time. This is some really cool stuff in the language. We're going to go down a little teeny bit of a rabbit hole here, but let's think about what's going on for a minute here. We've defined up here that person two is a var. That means at any time it can change. If we only have a single thread of execution in our application, that's perfectly fine. But it's possible that we have multiple threads running at the same time, and they both could be looking at that same instance of nullability. Maybe one is reading person, maybe one is writing it and changing it. So if we take a look here, when we do this if check to start with, I'm checking, I'm saying nullability person two. So I grab person two and I say, is he null or not? Cool. But some other thread may have changed person two right at that point. I'll say at this point. And because of that, Kotlin is saying, you know, I can't assume that nullability person two is still null, not null at this point. So this might blow up on you if you try to say nullability person two dot father, because you might have a null dot father. And that's a problem. We're going to find some things that we can do to take care of this a little better, but let's do it manually to start with. I'll duplicate him. Let's comment him out. And let's see what happens here. What we need to do is when we're checking something, grab the value and then check that value. So I can come in here and I can say val person two equals nullability, whoops, dot person two. So far, so good. 
So now person two, because he's the val, person two can't change. And if nullability person two changes, it doesn't matter because we already grabbed a snapshot. Oops. So then what I can do is say, if person two is not equal to null, then I'm going to come in here and say val father equals person two dot father. And once again, we're grabbing a snapshot of the father there. And so now if father is not equal to null, then I can say father.name and everything will work just fine. So this is actually closer to what this guy is doing. I'm going to say feels similar to that. But really is similar to this because we're grabbing snapshots along the way and we know that once we grab that we can keep progressing think about that if you had to write that every time how annoying it was and you had to do that in java and java didn't even give you this multi-thread issue it didn't detect that hey you just checked something that might be changing in some other thread and so that's a problem there so this is a huge boon for us. But what happens if we don't want to print out a null? So we actually want to have a real value as a default. So if at any place along, bleh, excuse me, if at any point along the line through this, we get a null back, and we just want to use a default value for that, maybe even a blank, or maybe you know no father name available, what we can do is use another operator. question mark colon, otherwise known as Elvis. And they call this the Elvis operator because if you turn your head to, let's see if I can get this right, if you turn your head counterclockwise a little bit, so towards your left shoulder, and look at that, it kind of looks like Elvis's eyes with his little curly hair uh, above the eyes. So they call this the Elvis operator. And what the Elvis operator does is if left hand side is not null, use that value. So that's the result. Otherwise, wow, that was a bad way to spell otherwise. Use the right side as the value. So with this null safe accessor that we're using, if at any given point we have a null, we immediately have this entire expression's value being null. Because that's on the left side of Elvis, we're going to use the right side as the resulting value. And that's really fantastic. If we are able to get all the way through this and nothing is null, we're just going to use that value. So even if name were null, if it were possible, I think in this case name isn't, yeah, name is not nullable. But if name were nullable, even if the name was null, we'd get down to that point to say there's no father name available. Okay, any questions on that? Elvis is a fantastic little operator. Now sometimes you wanna have a situation where if a value is null, it's an error and you just wanna quit right at that spot. And Elvis is fantastic for that. So let's say that we have a get some value from somewhere. Maybe this is going to return possibly a nullable person. And I'm just going to go ahead and explicitly say return null in this function for now. But maybe it could return an actual uh, a person at some point. So if I wanted to say val person, what am I up to? Three, I guess. Yeah, so person three equals get some value from somewhere. Now note if I float over person three, he says that he's nullable. If we look down here, we can see person three is a person three question mark. So he's nullable. But maybe we want to actually stop or throw an exception if uh, the person, if the value coming back is null. So we can just put a uh, question mark colon there to say, do something on this side. And we'll just say throw, let's say a legal state exception. 
I'm going to choose the Kotlin version instead of the Java, Java version. Can I get value? And so now, if I take a look at the value of person three, if I float over it, note that person three is not null. Because if it were null, we're going to throw an exception. That's going to get us out of this function. So it's impossible for person three to be used as a nullable. It has to be a null value. And so at this point, I could say println person three, question mark dot, just dot name. Well, if I try to do the question mark dot, note that it gives an, a warning here. And he says unnecessary safe call. The expression, this expression will have nullable type in future releases. Interesting. Because if I float over this now, you'll see that it's actually um, a string that's not null. But what that's telling me here is that in future releases, they're going to make this, they kind of force it to a nullable string if you put that question mark colon in explicitly. That's interesting. There's got to be a good use case for that that I'm not thinking of. But because of this warning here, I can back off it because we know that person three is not nullable. Okay, any questions on that? So now let's go back to uh, thinking about a, a binary tree again. Let me go up to here. I'm just gonna copy, might as well just copy this guy. And so inside of here, what I'm gonna do is have a, in the node, we will have a var left is a node nullable and he's null. And a right is nullable as well. So we can keep track of our, our children on there. And let's make our root be of type node and assign it to null to start with. Whoops, node question mark. Okay, and I want to keep this as an inner class. Uh, I'm going to keep it as an inner class for now. So when we're inserting here, let's see what this is going to look like. I'm going to say if root is null, then I'm going to say root is a node with the value. Else, I'm going to say root.insert node value. So let's define this insert function. Now we're going to use a recursive definition of insert inside the node. And I can say fun insert. And let's pass in another node here. And I'm going to say if, uh, let's see, if node.value is less than um, just value, then we're going to say if left is not equal to null, left.insert. So basically, if we have a left subtree, we're going to let the subtree take care of it for us. else left equals uh, node. Yeah, just like that. And then we'll do the same kind of thing for the right side. Whoops, that should be on the other side of this, though. Something kind of like that. But note we have that same issue about, well, left is mutable, therefore, let me float over them here, we can't assume that it's going to be a node because it may have changed in between that check and where we're actually using it. So we want to be a little smarter about how we're actually using this. We want to set it up so that we can do that insert if possible, otherwise set that left node. So what we really want to do here is say something like left question mark dot insert node 
Elvis something over here to set up that left node. Now, I can't just use curly braces here. Um, let's see, so what is, why is that looking weird? So yeah, it's, a, it's, yeah, you can't just use curly braces here because it's actually just a lambda and the lambda itself is not an expression that we're running. We need to run it somehow. And there's a little function called run. We're gonna look into details on these guys in a little bit more detail. A little function called run, who's going to say, execute the stuff inside this block and return it as an expression. So what we're doing with our, our Elvis here is we're saying, run the left if we can, if not, run the right. Because run is an expression, it's able to be here. By putting this as a lambda, the lambda doesn't return anything. So the Elvis is actually not gonna use it at all. And I think that'll end up causing us some compiler errors later on. I'm surprised it's not lighting it up right there. So down here, I can do the same kind of thing. Like that. And there we go. We now have an insert function that's recursive. So we're always going to try to insert on a subtree if it's possible. Otherwise, we're going to explicitly set our left or right node. Okay, question so far? Don't worry too much about what run is doing. We're going to get into much more detail a little bit later probably after the break. Um, and uh, just for right now, think of it as I want to do something in return and to return a value. Okay, so that's our insert. Let's go ahead and fix up this in order now, who's gonna be super, super easy. I can say left question mark dot, well, let's see if I wanna, how do I wanna do this this way? Um. Let me, just to make this a little simpler, jump ahead just a wee bit, and we're going to go on to these in a lot more detail. But I'm going to create an extension function on this value. So the value itself is an int. I'm going to pretend that this print value function is actually defined on the int class and not pass it in like this. And I can just refer to it as this. And this is pretty cool. What we can do inside here is say left question mark dot value question mark dot print value. And that's pretty nifty. So what we're doing is saying check to see if left is null or not. If it is, we're not going to do anything at all. We're just going to completely skip this. Now, technically, it's just returning a value of null and we're just not using it anywhere. If instead I had said val x equals, we'd be assigning x to null at that point. But a lot of times you're going to use these expressions without actually assigning their values or using their values anywhere. And this is one of those cases where we're just using the uh, the, the null safe accessor to um, conditionally run something. So if left is not null and value is not null, value itself won't be null, but because leading up to there, we had a possibility of a null, this left.value could be null if left were null. What we're gonna do then is if we have a non-null value, we're gonna call print value with value as the receiver. And that's using a this on it. So the receiver, is defined up here in front of this, and we're gonna go on these in much more detail later. Um, but when we're defining this, it basically makes it look like int has a new function attached to it called print value. And inside there, you can't access anything that's private inside int. You can only access things that are public, in this case, this. Um, but uh, if we were talking about uh, binary tree, we would only be able to add extension functions that accessed anything public in here, like this insert function. By doing this and by using this as an extension function, I can chain like this. I don't have to have any ifs. I don't have to do anything special. Um, there's another way we can do it without doing this extension function, uh, but I'm going to talk about those after the break. So let's take a look at that. We're going to say left value print, and we're going to say right. Oh, I'm sorry. 
we don't want to grab the value. We just want to say left print. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. I didn't even need to do that. Let me come back here a second. I'm not trying to print the left value. I'm trying to print the tree on the left-hand side. So I say in order. I got ahead of myself. There's what this should look like. Okay, so pretend that I just magically wiped your memory of the last two and a half minutes. So we're not talking anything about those extension functions there. I'm going to delete this up here. Maybe you have this little like daydream that something in the future is going to happen and we're going to talk about it in the future. But we don't need to talk about that right now because we're not doing anything with that. So what we're going to do is try to say if I have a left subtree, do an inner order traversal on it to print stuff out. If I have a right subtree, do an in order traversal to print it out. In between those two, print my current value. And that should allow me to print out my values in order. The insert inserts the values in order. So let's see what's going to end up happening here. Um, so we do that. And let's fix this guy up here. So if root is null, root is node.value, otherwise root insert. So I'm going to switch this around just a little bit. We're going to say root question mark dot insert node value. So if we have a non-null root insert, otherwise we're going to do another little run block here. We're going to say root equals node value. Just kind of like that. And then get rid of the rest of that. That's a much cleaner way to do it. And we don't have that issue of, ooh, root may have changed. Therefore, being in the else block, I can't assume anything about it. Here, we're following through on this to say if root exists, insert the node inside the root. Otherwise, I'm going to assign the root. So that's kind of nice. And let's see, anything else in there we need? I think that's pretty good. Let's do a main and try this guy out. And then we'll take a little break. So I'm going to say val tree equals binary tree three. I think we're doing three here. Yes. So we'll create him and then I can say tree dot insert 42. Let's put in some other values here. 100, 10, 60, 4, 12, 1,000, uh, 10,000, whatever. And maybe 437. And we have multiple mains in here, don't we? Call him main X. So then down here, I'm going to say tree dot in order. Oh, I don't have an in order function on there. Just kind of like that. So I'm using this equal syntax here because I only have a single expression that I'm running here. So I can just say when I call an order, call an order on the root if it exists. Now note that this is returning a value. So we might not want to use the equals. We might want to just go ahead and put it in curly braces, and then it's considered a unit function. It just depends on if you care if it's returning a value or not. Let's try this and see what it does. Hopefully my binary tree expertise is going to work. And oh, gross, look at this. It's printing out the object identifiers for everything here. And why is that happening? Let's take a look. So when we print, we're printing. Oh, I'm still printing this. <laughs> I forgot to change that back. There we go. Now we'll be OK. Let's run him now. There we go. So we see 4, 10, 12, 42, 60, 100, 437, and 10,000. So apparently the insert worked OK. Our in order traversal is printing them out in the appropriate order. And life is peachy. Okay, any questions on that? So now we've actually done something fairly real in Kotlin here, rather than little fake functions. We've actually created a data structure to hold data sorted so that we can print it out. Okay, any questions on that? Okay, let's go ahead and take a break. It is 8.40 right now. Let's start back up at 8.50.
starting. Any questions before we keep going? Anything so far? Okay. So what we're going to do next with this is we're going to take this binary tree and we're going to implement our template method and strategy using it. And there's a couple different ways we can do this. I'm going to go ahead and just copy him. I'll well copy both of those. We'll go to our next guy here. I'm going to say template method and strategy pattern. And let's see what we got here. So I'm going to say, let's go with the binary tree one this time. And what I'd like to do is set it up so that we can change this, va this print value function. Let's say that your, your boss has told you, okay, now I want you to print out the binary tree. And then maybe the next week he wants you to um, give the max value. The next week he wants you to give the min value. And later on he wants an average value. Um, and other times he may want to just, you know, give the sum of all the values. So there's any number of things that he could do with these. Um, rather than having these hard-coded print value function, let's actually make that be a property that we can set. So in this case, I can say, make it a var, and I can say print value is a function that takes an int and does something with it. And by default, I'm going to have it print the value. So by doing this, oops, it. By doing this, I can now replace that functionality. Um, actually, let me, before we do that one, let me, uh, I'm going to cut him, make sure I come back to him later. Actually, I want to do, let's do that. And then I'll paste him down there so I can come back. Let me do kind of the more traditional template method and strategy one to start with. And to do that, what we do is we define an open class and then make this an open function that can be overridden in subclasses. So we might have a binary tree one, and maybe I have a subclass of it, binary tree 1a that's going to just override that one print value function, kind of like that. And so this would give me a place to change that behavior so that as I'm walking through, now let's actually rename that instead of being print value, let's make that process value. Because we may not be printing, we might be doing something else with it. So what I want to do is when I see these values do something different. And maybe in this case, I want to print them with an X on either side. Uh, whoops, I'm going to have to put curlies around him and then put the X like that. So maybe I just want to print it with an X around the side. So I'm just doing something different. So in this case, I could do the same kind of thing, 1A. And let's rename this one here, one. And then tree in order, tree 1a in order, something like that. So this allows me to do things different. But notice that I have to create a whole new copy of the data structure every single time. So this is not ideal. Need a whole new copy of the data structure to do the different action. And this is a very tip, very typical template method and strategy. So in this case, this is a strategy function. Actually, I'm going to say it's a hook function because that's really what it is here. When you're just doing the, the template method, you have this guy here is a template method. And then the replaceable steps are what we call hooks. So the hook functions are places you can replace by changing them in a subclass. So this is a very um, 
kind of traditional OO style template method strategy pattern, uh, a template method pattern. So we're not really using the, the strategy yet. Strategy is when you pass something in. So in this case, we have our hook function. We're changing the hook. Override the hook to change behavior, replaceable behavior in the template method. So remember, all the template method is is algorithm with replaceable steps. And these are ideal for data structures because what's really nice here is we don't have to have the outsider know how to walk the data structure. We're just passing in a what to do when we see each of those nodes. And that's great because it, it really gives a lot of flexibility to the outsider without having to know all the little details and completely replace this whole in order function. We can keep these working exactly the same all the time. So let's try running this just to make sure he's okay. And we should see, yep, there are the results being printed out and then the results being printed out with the X's around. So we have different behavior. And that's okay, but it's much better if we can tweak the object to uh, uh, do something different for us. So on the fly, we change things. So let's go ahead and make another copy of this guy. And we're going to say he's going to be a strategy style template method. So if they might want to spell strategy correctly. And this is where I'm going to put in this guy. So instead of defining this function and having to override it, we can just assign that function. So it's going to be binary tree two. And oops, I want to call that process value as well. Note that the call to process value here works exactly the same as a function call because he is a functional type. Takes an integer, return, just does something with it, doesn't return a value. And here's our default implementation of that. So binary tree two should work exactly the same. It should feel exactly the same, but we can change this process value. So if I came down in here, let's do a, no, I think I'll just keep it as, is, as I'm doing here. Um, you know, actually, I'm going to put a interface on here so I can reduce some code down there. We'll call it binary tree. And the stuff you can do with a binary tree is you can insert a value and we can call in order. Well, I'm not going to bother with that. I'm just going to do it with the with the insert for now. So these guys are going to implement binary tree. And binary tree two. And I need to hit override on him and override on him. And what this is going to allow me to do is create a little helper function to do all those inserts. So I don't have to keep copying the whole blocks of code like that. I'm going to take these guys and I'm going to define a insert values, taking a binary tree, paste them in there. Let's just call it a tree. Just like that. And then I can say tree1.insert values. Oops, actually, no. Insert values tree one. And then insert values tree one A. And then I can do the same kind of thing for tree two. Do an in order. But after, yeah, after we do this in order, let's change that. Let's say tree two dot process value equals something else. So we can change it to do a print lint. Oh, come on, fingers. I was doing so well earlier on in the day. 
we'll just put y's around it this time instead of x's. And then do an in order again, and we should see a difference there. So let me go ahead and run him. And so now we see that here was their x's from before. This is our tree 2 being printed out. And then here's the ones with the y's around it. So we're able to change the behavior. And the nice thing here is we didn't have to create a new instance. Change behavior without recreating the data structure. And that's pretty nice. But it's still not optimal because we have this kind of awkward set this thing and then make this call again. If we could do those at the same time, that would be much, much nicer. So let's go ahead and create a third version of this with strategy uh, property. Let's create a third version of this. And I'm going to have this be strategy parameter. So instead of process value being defined up here, actually, let's go ahead and have it use that default. I'm going to define it right in this insert function. So I'm going to say you can pass in a process value there. He has a default value. So if you don't, if you don't specify them, it'll just print the values. But now, oh, that's insert. I didn't want it there. I wanted it in my in order. So now I can call process value exactly the same way. So replaceable step via parameter. And it reminds me, I've got to go back up and change that comment up here. Replaceable step via property. And is the override what he's not happy about? Or what is this? Redirect, redeclaration of, bi oh, binary tree two. I need to make this be tree three down here. So now we're going to pass that parameter in. Now, of course, down here, this is not going to work right because he's always calling that default. So we want to actually have a parameter passed down in just like that. So we can actually pass that in. Whoops, wrong place. Let's put them there. And then I can pass in process value. Kind of like that. So now this one gives us a lot more flexibility because what's going to happen here is every time I make the call, I can pass that in. So if I come down here, we're going to say tree three is a binary tree three, insert the values, do something like that. And now instead of saying process value here, I'm going to pass in that lambda representing what to do. Now note that with Kotlin, if the last parameter is a lambda, you can move it outside the parentheses, which is exactly what it's asking me to do here. And so if I hit Alt-Enter, boom. And notice one more thing. If the only parameter is a lambda, you don't need the parentheses at all. So I say tree in order, curly brace, blah, 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 the print line there. And so what this is going to do is pass in that lambda as the what to do. And this is making things much, much nicer to read. Let me go ahead and try running this. And we'll see that, whoops, I didn't, uh, wait a second. Do, 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 do. What did I do? So tree three, he's a binary tree three. Insert values tree three, that's good. So tree three in order is passing that process value in, has that default, that's fine. But in, in order in here, we're getting process value, passing the value. Oh, okay, so what happened? You'll notice here that when I call in order on left and right, I'm not passing that value down. I'm using the default, so it's defaulting to this print line up here. We just need to pass in process value. So we're doing the same action on all the children. 
now this will work just fine. But let me change that from, from a Y to a Z just so it's more apparent which one is getting run here. And now we'll see all the Z's there. That's much better there. So this is a way that you can make these data structures walkable and much more readable. Now when you write the code like this, you can put it all in one line, but quite often you're going to see it broken up kind of like that. So I have a tree three in order passing in the value kind of like that. Any questions on that? So this leads into the data structures that are already defined in Kotlin that can help you out with things. So if I came in here, I could say something like val, let's go ahead and put this in a new package. Define our main here. I can come and say val list equals list of one, two, three, four, five, something like that. And then I can say list dot for each Printlin it look familiar. This is another template method that's taking in a strategy as his parameter. And you're going to see this defined in all sorts of different types of data structures. Um, this particular one, if we look at the implementation of for each, we're going to see that uh, he's got a little bit more going on there, but he's basically just saying walk through. This is the, this here is the fixed part of the algorithm and action is the strategy being passed in there. Now don't worry about some of the other stuff with the, uh, the, the generics and things like that or the inline. We're going to talk about those later on, but this is virtually the same kind of thing we did with that in order. It just allows you to walk through the elements in the list and perform this action on them. So algorithm, that's the whole algorithm with replaceable steps right there. And that's pretty cool. And I find this much more readable than having to write a separate loop and access things. We're being much more generic on this saying, do this action on each item in the list. And this is gonna lead us to a much more functional style as we make little changes to things as well. So we might say something like list.map x dollar it x, something like that, and then print them out. So we might see something like this. And then when I run this, we're going to see those x's on either side without having to do this because we've actually created a new list. This function, which we'll take a look at later, creates a new list, which is a copy of all the values run through whatever this modification is that we've done. So I'm going to go ahead and delete that, but that's just kind of like a little bit of you know, foreshadowing for some things that we're going to be doing later on. And it lets us chain these things like crazy, making our life a lot easier and a lot more, uh, a lot tighter. The code is much more terse and easier to read once you're used to it. It's a little bit weird to start with when you start seeing code that looks like that. But once you get used to it, it becomes much, much more readable. Okay, questions so far? Okay, so keep in mind, we're doing this whole template method and strategy thing all over the place. You're going to see lots and lots of this. And that's all that's going on behind the scenes is we're, we're passing in some behavior changes for the algorithm that we're going to be running. And that's why I like to talk about that. It's a great pattern to start with, but because you're going to see it so heavily here, I really like to stress template method and strategy. Okay, so that is... Let's see, in Kotlin's list class, we have the same type of template method with strategy parameter all over the place. Okay, so that was number four. Let's take a look at number five down here. Now we saw a little earlier that run function, and I'd like to spend a little time talking a little bit more about what that run function is actually doing. Um, let's define a main here. And I'm gonna define, let's see, how do I wanna do this? Let's define a helper function here. Do stuff. And we're gonna have a string value being passed in. 
And we might want to do something with that string value if it's not null. We might want to do something else if it is null. What I'm going to do is take a look at one of these scoping functions to capture it. Now keep in mind, uh, when we did our uh, null safe accessors, if I said something like value question mark dot length, that is going to say if the value is not null, get the length of the string. Otherwise, I'll give it a zero, for example, like that. Now I'm not doing anything with it, there. that's why it's complaining. But if I did something like that, this is a nice little statement that says if I have a value, get its length, otherwise just use a zero for the length. You're going to do things like this all the time. But maybe we want to do something more than just get a property or more than just run a function on something. If I said I wanted to say if the value, um, you know, let me put this in a class so that I have that, that um, uh, possibility of it changing. So I'm going to say var string string question mark equals null and then we'll put do stuff inside of there kind of like that. Well let's call that name instead of just string. Whoops. So one of the things that we saw before is if I do something like if name is not equal to null, then maybe I want to do some stuff with this with the name, like you know, val x equals name plus AAA, and maybe val y equals name dot length, which is one place where we're gonna have an issue because name could have changed between there and there. And then maybe val z equals ah let's just say dollar x dollar y so we're just doing some stuff with the string inside there and then i'm going to print len z so we're doing more than just one expression here and we want to do this if the string value is not null this is one of the places where it's useful to use something called a scoping function and what we saw that would work in its place here is if I said val name snapshot equals name, then because this is a val, I can replace name with him, and that'll work just fine because we've taken a point in time snapshot. Name snapshot is never going to change because we declared it as a val. That's kind of verbose to define this variable and then use it like this. So what would be really nice is if we made a function to do this for us, and if we pass in the value as a parameter, we can just use that, for example. So if I did something like this, let's say I had a function um, do stuff, passing in a string, string, Remember that in all functions, the parameters are always vowels. So when we pass that function in, we now have a vowel. But we'll also pass in a lambda there. We'll call it action, which passes in a string. Note that it's not null. And it does something with it. So then inside here, I can just say action, passing in string. And that may not seem super interesting. I mean, it's it's a pretty dull little function here, but think about what it does. It lets us pass in a string. The string is now fixed. That's basically doing this bit for us. Oh, I forgot to put our if not null. Let's go ahead and say it's question mark on that one. And I'll say if string not equal to null, do stuff if not null. There we go. And we'll only do stuff that's not null. So what I could do here is instead of the code that I wrote above, I could say do stuff if not null, passing in name and this code. Kind of like that. Now note that the snapshot coming in is by default named it. So if I only have that one parameter coming to a lambda, it gets it by default. But I can rename that. 
kind of like that. And now I have the same kind of code. Now here he's complaining because he's overridden. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and call him name there, and that will probably, yeah, it works just fine. So we're passing in our parameter inside this lambda is called name. We use it. He becomes my snapshot. I'm using that lambda parameter as a snapshot. And that works just fantastically. Now, instead of using the lambda parameter, we could also change it to use a receiver and create an extension function. So if I did another one of these guys, and let's say that I say, I'm gonna create an extension function on string. So I'm gonna pretend that the string class has some new function. And I'm gonna get rid of this whole if not null mess. Whoops. And pass in this. So this is defining a function called do stuff as though it were actually defined in the string class. And all it's going to do is turn around and call action this. Now, what could this possibly do for me? It doesn't seem to be super helpful. But if we come up here and take a look at it, I can say name question mark dot do stuff and pass in these guys. just like that. And that's a little bit more readable. Now we're taking advantage of that null safe accessor to only call do stuff if it's not null. In this case, we're calling do stuff if not null every single time. So there's always a function call. And that function had to know that we wanted to check for a null. Here, do stuff doesn't care. It's just going to run this function holding onto that parameter for us and we can pass in whatever we want up front. So if we had something that's not nullable, we could pass it in. If we have something that's nullable, we could pass it in. And that is checked based on that null safe accessor rather than having to be checked inside of the function itself. And I find this pretty readable once you get used to it. And what we've just implemented here is basically the let function. I'll say almost similar to let. There's a little difference in that the let function actually returns a value. So whatever the last value is inside that function, it's going to return it. But it's a very similar function. Let's take a look at what that would look like. I can come in here and say name question mark dot let. And what that does is it evaluates the receiver. So that name there, question mark dot says only continue if it's not null. So let is receiving a non-null string for sure. And then it calls this function passing in that name. Now it also returns whatever the last value in that let is. So if I wanted to come in here and say, I'm just going to return Z, I can say var Z equals that. Anyone want to guess what the type of that Z is going to be? That val that I just created, what do you think its type is going to be? Because we're, we're getting uh, type inferencing happening here. So it has to figure out what are the possible types of values that could come back. So we see string. Anybody agree with that? You're really close. What happens with that question mark dot? If name is null, what type is going to be the result of name question mark dot something? It's going to have to be a nullable string because it's possible if name is null then it won't evaluate past that question mark dot. So that means null is a valid value. If it's non-null, the result coming out is a string, like you said. So if I float over Z here, we'll see that it says string question mark. So it's a nullable string coming out of there. Um, and that can be very, very valuable. And we can chain this even more if we want to. So let's say that we wanted to actually know 
the length of that guy, I could right after this say dot length. But note, of course, that that's not going to work because the value here is a nullable string. So I'm going to have to put a question mark in front of it. And I can use Elvis to make it a zero. Again, if I just did the question mark dot length, Z length is now a nullable integer. So if I float over it, I'll see it say int null because it could be a null, meaning it didn't get far enough to do the length or it's going to return that length. If I wanted it to always be a non-null, I could put the question mark zero on the end, and now z length is just going to be an int, because no matter how we get through this, even if the value is null, I'm going to make that value be a zero, so it's going to be a valid int. Any questions on that? Now I'm going to get rid of that part there. Let is a scoping function. And really what it does is it captures the current value of the receiver as the parameter to the lambda. That's the most important thing. And then at the end, it returns last expression in the lambda. So that's really what he does. And he's very useful for the if not null scenario. Most often used for if not null, capturing the value being tested. And by capturing that value, we make sure that it can't be changed by another thread. So we're just doing that point in time snapshot of the name and passing it in, then returning that last value. And sometimes you don't care. Sometimes you don't actually use that last value, in which case, you know, we don't do this assignment in front of here. Let is going to be a function that you're probably going to use quite a bit. And if we take a look at, let's go back couple here. Um, this guy right here. So we take a look at that function. Another way you could write that would be left question mark dot. Oh, actually, is that the one? I, that wasn't the one I was thinking of. Um, no, the way it's written, I like. Um, No, it wasn't in here. There'll be another example that I'll come up with a little bit later that covers that, so don't worry about that. Um, but let is something you're going to use quite a bit just to capture a value, test nullability, things like that. Another one that's very, very common is called apply. And again, he is another scoping function. And what he's going to do is he's going to capture the receiver as this. And inside the body of that uh, lambda, it's going to be the receiver for that body. So you're going to be able to just reference this inside of there. And then it's going to return this afterwards. I'll say return the receiver. And this is mostly used for initialization. So let's see where we have an example of this guy. Let me create a little helper class up here. Um, let's do a, let's see if we had a normal class person, and maybe he didn't have a uh, primary constructor. So he doesn't do anything when you create him. You just create him not passing parameters in. But then he has a name and an age as properties inside of him. And I'll give him default values like that. And let's say that I want to use this person without constructor. I'll say without constructor params because he has a constructor, but there's just no params to the constructor. So down here, I might say something like val person equals person without constructor params paren paren. And then we might proceed to say person 
dot name equals Scott person dot age equals uh, 55, something kind of like that. Now this is a little bit gross perhaps. Um, here it's not quite so bad, but if I tried to do this as a uh, property that I'm initializing in the class, let's see what happens. So if I copy that, actually let's copy all of these. Put them up here. Note that I can't do this. I can't just have this person.name and person.age floating around. So I'd have to create a constructor body here, an initializer, and put it in kind of like that. And note that you can actually have multiple initialization blocks, and they'll be executed in the order that they appear in the class. And together they all become the body of the constructors that are being run. But this is kind of gross. It's kind of separated out. I'd like to be able to pull that together, and this is where apply is actually very useful. So instead of that, we can say val person equals person without constructor params dot apply, and note over here it says this is a person without constructor params. So this instance that we've created gets passed into this lambda, and then I can just initialize it. I can hit those properties because this is the person that I'm creating. At the end of this, the return value from the apply is that same object. So that object is going to get assigned to the person. So basically what's happening is this apply can be thought of as an initializer attached at the end of object creation or object access depending on where you're getting it. So we're going to create that object pass it into apply, do some initialization, and then return it so we can assign it to that variable. Make some sense? This is an incredibly useful thing, and it's especially nice if you're doing some chaining, and in that chaining you create something, you can initialize it, and then continue your chain. So after this, I could even have other chain things. I could do a apply here as well, and do some more. Now it's it's kind of useful to have two apply useless to have two applies in a row because you could just have them be in the one apply. Um, but you can chain these guys to add other actions. Okay, questions on that one? So for the most part, think of apply as being really useful for initialization. That's the main thing that gets used. Okay. Now we also saw run. And actually, let me just copy all this stuff and see if that makes sense. I'm going to say run as a scoping function. Let's go ahead and do something kind of like a name question mark dot run, passing in a block. And what he's going to do is he's going to be passing in the receiver. So he captures in, captures the current value of the receiver as this in the lambda. And then he returns the last expression from that. So if I set inside here, I'll just return the length. I could say something kind of like that. And that'll return that. So if I float over length, it should be an int. Yep, he's nullable because of this here. Now, of course, what I just wrote there is kind of silly because it'd be a lot simpler to just write val length equals name one dot length Elvis zero, right? That would be a much much uh, simpler way to do it. But let's suppose that we had some other things we wanted to do inside here. Like if um, char at, I think this, oh, no, I have to use uh, array syntax. So let's say if we say the first character, can I just say first? Yeah, so if the first character is A, then I'm going to return 42, else I'm going to return the length. So that might be an, a reason to do something a little bit more complex, is we can use this run to do extra operations in there. Now, what I'm doing is kind of gibberish. There's probably no real value for that. But you can see that in this case here, 
I'll just call it result. I'm capturing that name, passing it in as this, and just returning whatever that last value is. In this case, it's the, the value of the if-else expression. Okay, so sometimes that's useful. Most of the time, just do some stuff in an expression context. So if you need an expression somewhere and you need to do more than one thing where that expression is, typically you might throw a run on there. And then that way you can have it return a value and life's peachy. Okay, any questions on that? Now the final one, uh, well, the final one that's similar to this is called also. And I think I've used this exactly once in my life. And I honestly can't remember where that was because I probably could have done it 16 other ways as well. But also, I'll just copy this block again, is a scoping function where we're going to capture that current value as it in the lambda. And we're going to return the receiver for the lambda. So this is a way to just do some extra stuff along the way. So if you create something, like let's say we said val thing equals, I'll uh, we'll create a new person. He's thing from the Adams family. And he's a thousand, oh, doesn't have, that's right. We don't have, that particular person doesn't have a uh, an age. So we might create him, and maybe we just want to do something extra while we're working with that. So let's say that when we create this, we need to go off and put it into a data structure. So I might say also um, add to data structure or database, and then return this. So this gives you some extra stuff you can do. It feels very, very similar to apply. The big difference is instead of getting this passed in, it gets it passed in. So it's more of a style thing. You're not gonna use it all that often. So let's say not used often. Sometimes used to do extra things in the middle of a chain of functions. So we might stumble across a place that gets used, but again, I almost never have used this, this thing. Um, apply is, is pretty much just as easy. I think the only reason I'd probably want to use this is if I'm inside of another this scope. So maybe this becomes ambiguous. Um, having that named parameter might make more sense but then we're just returning it. So it's just, you know, do something along the way with it. It's not super, super useful. Okay, there's one other scoping function called width. So width does not take a receiver. Passes value as this to lambda. And so this looks kind of like this. You could say with name, and then inside there, if length, well, actually, let's create a person. So with, well, I've got a, I got a person ready. I'll say with thing. If name is not equal to thing, then we'll do something else we'll do something else. Maybe we say name equals uh, Hondo. So we could change it. So th there's different things we can do with this. I don't use this function too often because I really prefer working with things as receivers. Um, but it is here if you prefer to have strictly a function call that doesn't take a receiver. Um, it's really, I mean, if you're doing this, you may as well call let or you may as well call apply or something like that. So in this in this case, it's taking of this, apply would be more, more uh, common there. 
but it's another function you can call. It's for me, it's not as useful. Um, I think they included it because other languages had a with construct and somebody liked that. And so they decided, well, we'll let people do this, but it's really not the preferred way of doing things. We really prefer using one of the scoping functions on a receiver. Okay, any questions on that? Okay, so let's see. I have 25 minutes. Just looking at my to-do list over here, which things I want to talk about. Um, let's talk a little bit more about some expressions. Now that we've done some things with null and we've seen the uh, the null safe accessor, that's one type of expression, there's a few other things we can do. So let's say that I had a function foo that takes in a, let me create a data class up here again, person name string I don't say that we're passing in a person here but it might be a nullable person so we don't know if what's coming in is null or not um, one thing that we can do is if we know at a certain point something is absolutely positively has to be non-null we can use the bang bang operator and that looks kind of like this I could say if person well, that'll smart cast on me, so I don't want to do it there. Let's do it as, and we'll say var person person equals person with a blank name to start with. And we'll put our function foo in there. And I could say if person is not equal to null. And if for some reason, um, oops, I want him to be question mark. There we go. If for some reason I absolutely am convinced that there's no possible way for this to get set to null, like let's say I make it private and maybe I have some checks inside of this class to make sure that there only one thread can be doing something at a time, then I could say person well, if I tried to say person.name and print that out, it's going to give me the error, right? Because person could have changed. But I could say person bang bang dot name. And the bang bang says this person is definitely not null. Trust me. So the compiler is going to let you off the hook at this point. But at the runtime, it's going to double check. So trusted but verified at runtime. So the compiler is going to let you compile that, but then verify it at, at runtime. Almost never use this. There are a few cases this is going to come up once in a while where because of some structure in the language, you might not be able to let the smart cast take advantage. Um, and in those cat or and, and for some other reason, you won't be able to use a let. Um, every once in a while, you're going to get in a weird situation where the compiler just won't smart type smart cast it for you and it won't know that something's non null and you know for certain at that point in time that that value cannot be null um, then in that type of case you may want to use this but almost never try your best to never ever use this use your question mark dot instead and that usually means you're going to have to have a, a fallback on there but that's a really good way to go about things is just use that uh, null safe accessor instead. Okay, any questions on that? Now there is a function that you can also use to help you out here. You can say require not null passing in the person and then do something like that. And what this is going to do is if the person is null, it's going to throw an exception there. And you could pass in an extra lambda there that describes um, what message to say. Oops, person doesn't exist, or person not set. Move them out like that. There we go. So you could do something kind of like that 
which is going to uh, set up a message and throw that as a, a, an exception at that point saying the person isn't set. This first one will just say, you know, null, null pointer exception, I believe. Um, this is a little nicer than using the bang bang because you have more control of it, especially on the message area. Note that that message is generated by a lambda. And that's because this message might not be cheap to create. You might have something where maybe you look some information up or log something um, and then maybe create the, the message there. Um, this sets it up so that that lambda is only evaluated if the person is not null. If we had passed in a string as a direct parameter, then that's always going to get evaluated, even if the value uh, is perfectly fine. Um, so this is something that you can do. This is a much better alternative to the bang bang. And this is something where I use this fairly frequently in Android applications. Because there's a lot of places in Android applications where you know for certain that the state of something has to be non-null in a certain step in the life cycle. And there's really no way to represent that in your code other than you just happen to know that. So, because, uh, you know, it might be that, you know, during one of your life cycle functions, something hasn't been initialized yet, but later on it's initialized in a different part of your life cycle. So you can take advantage of that and say, hey, I require this to be non-null. And you really don't have to explain it much. Yeah, it's, it's something that's a, a little bit more clean that way. Okay, so that's that guy. Let's take a look at checking the types of things. So let me come in here. I'm going to create actually a couple other packages here. Week 408 and 409. And then let's create a couple of files in there. So 408, 409, that all looks good. Okay, so we just did 6, 7, 8, yeah, those look good. Okay, so, come on, there we are. Um, let's take a look at uh, setting up different types. Let's say if we have a type hierarchy, we want to check to see what something really is. So maybe I have an abstract class mammal, and underneath that I have a class dog, and we'll give him a, a name, and maybe we'll have a cat that also has a name. And then maybe inside my main, let's actually just create a, a helper function here. We'll say fun animal stuff taking in, well, let's say mammal, mammal stuff, taking in a mammal. And inside there, let's say that we wanted to check to see what that mammal is before we do something with it. Maybe dog has a bark function. And maybe cat has an annoy function. where they're going to try to trip the overlord. Because um, that's what cats do. They weave between your legs. And I'm a cat person, so I can say that. Um, so in the mammal function, what we want to do is if we take a look to see what something is, we can then call the appropriate function. So I could do something saying if mammal is cat, then I can do something with that. So let's take a look. Oh, I didn't have them extend. That might help. What this error message is saying is, hey, there's, that's not possible because cat is not a type mammal. It's not a subtype. Therefore, it'll never be true because I screwed up. I forgot to put the superclass in there. So inside here, I can now say mammal.annoy. And then I can say else if mammal is dog, mammal.bark. Let's take a look at what's going on here. This is operator is going to check to see is the instance of this, whatever this variable is pointing to, of this type or some subtype of it. And that's what the is does. It's similar to instance of in Java. 
And here we're going to say if the mammal is a dog, we're going to make him bark. Now notice what happens when I say is mammal is cat. Mammal is a parameter. Therefore, it's final. Well, I'll say it's val. It's not mutable. You can't change it. Therefore, once we do a test like this, the compiler can say, oh, if this succeeded, I know in the body of this block that mammal is definitely a cat. So now I can do cat things with it. So it does a smart cast to cat. And then down here, he does a smart cast to dog. And this is one of my favorite features of Kotlin. Because what it does for you is it lets you call functions without having to do an explicit cast on things which is crazy annoying in Java, having to, you test for it and then you have to cast it right after it. The smart casting is fantastic because, yeah, I know it's a cat, therefore let me use it as a cat, directly as a cat. And these are great. Now you can also use the inverse of this. If mammal not is cat, and the not is operator just inverts it. And I can say println, it's not a cat. That's all I know at that point. I don't really know what the type is. If you see up here when I float over this guy, well, float over him in here, he says he's been casted to, to a dog. But if I try to reference it inside here, all I know at this point is that he's of type mammal. I don't know anything more about him. The only thing I know is he's definitely not a cat. And I can do the same kind of things down here. If he's not a dog, I can say it's not a dog. Now these can be nice and all, but it's also nice to be able to use the chaining type syntax. And one of the things you can do is say, hmm, I think it might be a cat. Let me go ahead and try casting it. So I could just say mammal as cat. And if I do that, I'm explicitly saying treat it like a cat. Now that could blow up on my face because there's nothing in this function that's explicitly saying the mammal is a cat. All we know at this point is mammal is a mammal. If I do this, I'm taking a chance. And the compiler's going to try to trust me here. But then again, at runtime, it's going to verify. And if the mammal's not a cat, that is going to get an illegal cast exception. It's not going to be able to do that cast. So what we can do is say this. That blows up if it's not a cat. So instead of that, what I can try is mammal as question mark cat. And this says, if mammal's a cat, great. I can use it as a cat. Otherwise, the return value there is null. So I can do something like this. I can say mammal as cat question mark dot annoy and if it can cast it to a cat it will otherwise it's going to return a null and this can be really useful in a chain of things I can do the same kind of thing if it's a dog Note that annoy no longer works because it now knows there's a dog there. I can make him bark. Something kind of like that. Okay, any questions on that? That's how you do your cast in Kotlin. It's a little bit cleaner looking than how you do them in Java, where you have to have the, the type out on, in front of the, uh, the variable that you want to cast. Um, but casting is still kind of annoying. If you can at all do a smart cast, that's going to be the best thing for you. So if I came in here, another option is a when. I can say when mammal is cat. Then I'm going to say mammal dot annoy. Otherwise, if it's a dog, else... Maybe I don't do anything, or you know, maybe I wouldn't need an else in that case. Um, 
Makes sense. Any questions? And we'll come back to this when a little bit later when we talk about, well, probably not tonight, but um, later on, uh, probably the next class, when we talk a little bit more about sealed classes and interfaces and how you can use this when expression um, exhaustively. It becomes really, really super useful. Okay, so let's go one more here. I'm going to say useful operator overloads. Operator overloading is one of these things used with caution. Because I've, I've had places where people really abuse operator overloading to not mean what the operator looks like. Um, there's a library in Kotlin for generating HTML, which overloads the, the prefix plus, the, the unary plus operator. And it is the most non-intuitive thing in the world. Behind the scenes, it creates a text node that it adds as a child. It's, it's gross. And it's, it's something that it's, it's just non-intuitive. In an even worse case, a long time ago when I was working with C++, somebody over the, overload the plus operator to do a modulo arithmetic after it did the adding. And that caused a bug that took me forever to find because you just don't expect X plus Y to do anything different than just adding X and Y. You really expect it to just do X and Y. Um, but behind the scenes it was doing a mod. And so I'm looking through the code and nothing is popping out to me as causing errors until I finally, I think it was about a day and a half later, took a look at the code and I'm like, they didn't override plus, did they? And then I looked at it and it's like, oh, don't do that. Only do the overloads if it really, really makes sense. And there's a few that are super, super useful. I'll put him down here like this. So the first one is the um, contains operator. So if you define contains, you can use the in operator, in and not in operators. Uh, that one's really useful if you're defining a data structure. Then there's also get and set. And let's see, set index value. Again, great for matrix like structures. And we'll see how that's useful in a little bit there. These are a few that are just very, very nice. There aren't really many more that you're going to want to overload because it'll just confuse people if you do that. So let's um, create a really simple matrix type class here. Let's say that I say I have a class matrix and I'm going to define it as being val rows int and val columns int, something like that. And I need something to store it in. So I'm just going to store the data inside of a list here. So I'm going to say private val data equals, I will make it a mutable list of ints. So just hold ints inside of there. And what I'd like to do is be able to access this as a two-dimensional uh, matrix instead of having to do some computation every time. So in order to do this, I'm going to say operator fun get passing in the row int and the column int and then return a value based on that. And this is actually going to return an int. Let's put that there. And what I can say here is return data sub some index that represents the, the rows and the columns. So let's jump to the row we're interested in so we know how big the rows are by the number of columns. So I can say, um, let's assume that these are going to be one based instead of zero 
just to kind of show that you can do this because a lot of times when you're looking at a matrix you want to think row one is the first row as opposed to row zero is the first row so i'm going to say row minus one so i get back to my zero base for my actual data under the, behind the scenes times columns that's going to jump to a certain location in there i'm going to add in the row after that i add row minus one Ooh, should be columns minus one make sure i do that um no actually it's the number of columns that we have so it's uh it's going to jump that that many pieces forward and then plus row minus one i believe that's going to be correct um and then let's do something similar for set and you know what i'm going to do i'm going to actually make that index uh, so we'll say private fund index for row Oops, int and column int equals that. And then I can say index for row, comma, column. Oh, I should have actually, that should be adding the column, not the row. See, I did it wrong already. And then I can say data that equals the value being passed in. And that's not returning anything. So let's get rid of that colon int. And let's see if this is actually going to work. I'm going to make a little main. And I'm going to print it out in a bad format for the moment. So let's do a two string. Oops, I actually want to generate that two string. So generate two string, just the data. That's all I care about there. Well, I should put the rows and columns too. Okay, let's try that again. So alt insert two string. We'll do all the data there. There, that's nice. So then inside of the main, I'm going to say val matrix equals matrix. Let's have it be a two by three matrix. And then I can say matrix sub one comma two equals, well, let's do one, point, one comma one equals 42. And then I'll do a println of matrix. And we'll see if that kind of looks about right. Now it's not going to be pretty printout, but that's something we could do something interesting with. Index zero out of bounds. For length zero. Oh, because I created this mutable list without having any slots inside of it. So what I really want to do inside here is say mutable list of, actually I can do mutable list uppercase and pass in the number of slots. So it'll be rows times columns. And then I pass in initializer for what each value is going to be to start with. Actually, let's pass in a negative one. And let's try that now. So we're seeing that the 42 came in at 1, 1. So 1, 1 is the first slot, so he filled him in. Let's go ahead and assign something else. 1, 2, so that's row 1, second spot. Make that be 24. Let's run him again. And we'll see that it filled in the right slot as well. Um, and then if I want to print out matrix sub one comma one, boom, I get that 42 coming out. And that makes this data structure a lot more easy to understand. Okay. Now I can also add that contains function in here by saying operator fun contains passing in the value that we want to check for. And that's going to return a Boolean. And then inside there, I'm just going to say return data dot contains value. Or alternatively, I could say return value in data. Either of those would be perfectly fine. So calls data.contains behind the scenes. 
And so now down here I can say println matrix, uh, whoops, 10 in matrix, 24 in matrix, something kind of like that. Print out 42 not in matrix. So we can do some tests like that. And that makes this just a much easier data structure to work with. It just reads better. Okay, so those are, those are the main ones that if you wanna overload an operator, those ones are good ones to do. Try to avoid other ones. There really aren't a whole lot of other ones that I would recommend it. Um, you know, your, your mileage may vary. You might come across something where it makes perfect sense, but just make sure it feels intuitive for the type of data structure you're creating. Um, these in particular, I think feel very, very intuitive because it really looks much more like the math way you'd reference a, uh, a matrix as opposed to constantly having to do this every single time you want to reference a slot in a matrix. Okay, any questions on that? Okay, cool. So I got through most of what I wanted to cover and there's some other things we'll cover next week. I will post the assignment after the class. Um, anyone have any questions before we call it a night? Okay, cool. Well, have a wonderful night, everybody. Good luck on the next assignment, and I will see you next week.